a few announcements to get started. Uh, there's a homework that's due on Thursday. That's the 15th. So uh, it's uh, hopefully you've started. I know that there's a lot of uh, discussion on GIATSA. It involves uh, linear models. It involves uh, feature transformation, mistake bound learning. These are the theory parts of the homework. And then there's some experiments involving perceptron that you'll be uh, uh, you'll be playing with a few variants of the perceptron algorithm. Um, you know, if you haven't started, I encourage you to start as soon as possible. You still have two days. There's also the late day, but you still have two days. And then uh, uh, also do take advantage of office hours and uh, the discussion on Piazza. Are there any questions that we can talk about that we can get out of the way now? Yes. Um, I don't care really. Um, so yeah, there's a project milestone that's due uh, on Feb 20th. It's a very simple milestone. Um, you need to just create an account on Kaggle if you don't have one already. I don't think you need to really. I I, I don't. I will never know what email you use. You just need to tell me your ID so that I can link them up. Um, and uh, just a word of warning about the data for uh, the Kaggle thing. The data files are fairly large. Uh, uh, so we provided uh, three different, four different feature sets that you can use. And two of them are um, CSV files that are like about a few hundred megabytes each. Um, so together the entire download like two gigs. Just be aware of that. Um, if you uh, kind of take a look at that CSV file, you'll find that most of the features, it's 1,000 dimensional space, and most of the features are zero. Sorry, 10,000 dimensional space, and most of the features are zero. So this is a very, very inefficient encoding of this information that I have used. Um, and as a result, the file sizes have become really large. On the other hand, it makes your job easier with respect to reading and writing the uh, data because you can use the same code that you've used so far. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Any other questions? There's a lot of interesting discussion on uh, Piazza um, about the, the homework. So I feel like if you have uh, questions, there's some chance that your questions are already addressed in that discussion. So do take a look. Uh, also, we can use Piazza for discussions on the project. There's like the, the project section of Piazza can serve as the, uh, the discussion board for that. If there are no questions, we're going to dive into the technical part of uh, today's lecture. Today, we're going to start and hopefully end a topic, uh, uh, this new topic on uh, a regression, in particular, least mean square regression. Um, how many people have, have uh, encountered linear regression before? A big majority of you. And how many people have seen uh, least mean squares before? Okay, the same number, hopefully. Uh, so uh, hopefully this, what we see today, will not be entirely new for you. But at the same time, uh, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to introduce um, a somewhat uh, uh, important idea in machine learning uh, that serves as the dominant idea for building all kinds of models that we have today. Uh, which, in, which is basically the idea of uh, minimizing some sort of a cost function or loss function. So we'll get there uh, sometime in the middle of this lecture. So I'll start off by looking at, uh, we will look at some examples of uh, linear regression, and uh, then I'll set up the uh, optimization problem that is used for um, so, uh, for training, in some sense, the learn for, uh, for training the regression model. And we'll talk about uh, the gradient descent and uh, stochastic gradient descent. And it turns out at the end of this lecture, I'll just mention that uh, even though I'll talk about gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, it turns out for linear regression, you don't need any of that. And you can actually solve the uh, optimization problem that this objective defines on paper. And I'll leave that as an exercise for how to solve it. Some of you may have already done this before. So let's uh, start off by looking at some examples. Um, the instances for linear regression could be anything, just like the instances for any machine learning problem can be anything. Uh, 
Um, so Im imagine that you have the following linear regression box. The int yes. instance is a car. Um, and the goal is to predict the mileage of the car. And of course, um, you know, predicting the mileage of a car is more than just some sort of mathematical modeling problem that you can learn, but let's pretend that it can be done. Uh, let's pretend it can be done correctly. Um, importantly, unlike the examples that we've seen so far, the mileage is a number. It's in fact a positive number, but for our purposes, it's a real number. And whereas in classification, we had a discrete set of categories that we were predicting in regression, we have the output, the label space consists of real numbers. I said the instances are cars, but in fact, we don't really take cars as input programs. We need to somehow convert them into features. Mm -hmm. And so let's say we convert them into these two features here. One of them is the weight of the car, the other one is the age of the car. And let's say that uh, we can somehow, using the weight and the age of a car, predict its mileage. And what we want from using the terminology that we've used in the class is there is a hidden function, an oracle function that can use these two features, x1 and x2, to predict the mileage of a car somehow. Or even better, there's an oracle function that can use the entire Yeah, that can, there's an oracle function that can use the instance, the car, to predict its mileage. And we don't have access to that oracle function. We don't know what that function looks at. Instead, we just look at some features of that data. So one way or another, there's a function that predicts the mileage of the car. We don't have access to that function. We would like to find that function. Instead, we get access to that function in action. So for four different cars, we know what its mileage is from whatever the function that nature uses to predict its mileage. Um, in fact, uh, the way you actually measure a mileage of a car is not using a mathematical function. You know, actually, you know how to measure the mileage of a car. Um, and let's say we have these four instances. And now, our goal is to construct a function that can predict uh, the real number. There are an infinite number of functions that, we, that can take these two uh, vectors to some real number. What we're going to do is we're going to make a hypothesis space assumption. The hypothesis space that we assume for this problem is that the output is a linear function of the input. So in particular, the mileage is some weight multiplied with the first feature, some other weight multiplied with the second feature, plus an extra bias term. Here, the bias term is just W0. The important thing, the difference between regression and classification is in regression, the answer is just this dot product. In classification, or at least the binary classification thing that we saw before, the answer is not the dot product. Notice that this is a dot product. Uh, this is W1, or w, let's put it this way, W0, W1, W2, dot product with 1, X1, X2. So in regression, the answer is this dot product. Had this been a classification task, you take the dot product and look at its sign. Um, the goal of learning here is to use whatever training data we have to find the best possible value of these weights W. Collectively, I'm just calling them W. And once learning is done, you can go out and predict, make predictions for new cars. You just say, uh, compute these two features and then apply the function that was learned and you, get, you can predict the mileage. Here, the parameters of the model are the three Ws. And so we'll I'll just call them the model rather than the model parameters. And collectively, of course, they form a vector. Any questions about just this example or the setup here? And as we go through this, if uh, you've already seen this, just try to map what I say to what you already know. So let's generalize what we have. Inputs, uh, let's pretend that somebody else has done the feature extraction for us. The inputs are vectors. I'm calling them x again. And these are d-dimensional vectors. And the outputs, because we are working in a regression uh, with a regression problem, the outputs are real numbers. Um, so the output y can be any real number in R. And uh, just for the sake of uh, simplicity, I will assume that the first feature is always the number one. 
Why am I doing that? Bias. It's the bias term, mm -hmm. so that I don't have to carry that term along. Um, and just to kind of uh, confuse you, uh, I'm not using B here. I'm using one of the bias term is one of the W's. Um, it's just a, and just to confuse you even more, I'm starting by indexing with one here. Uh, I don't know why I did that. In any case, uh, we are in, we are operating in the support set, which means that we have a training set. The training set consists of uh, instances xi paired with the corresponding labels yi. And our goal is to approximate y as a linear function of the features. So specifically, I can, um, uh, or compactly, I can say my goal is to find some w such that y is equal to w transpose x. And of course, when I say we want to find a w, this sets up a learning problem. Our goal is to learn the way, learn the way. Any questions? This is just like a, a one slide summary of the setup for linear regression. Let's see some uh, examples. Imagine that your data looks like this, and this is a one dimensional case. The instances are one dimensional. In other words, it's just each instance is a single number, and the label, of course, is the other dimension. And so for this example here, this is the label. And uh, notice, importantly, that these points don't form a line. Just visually looking at it, you know that the points don't form a line. But I can approximate a line that uh, uh, seems like a good one that uh, uh, passes through the middle. And uh, the, the, you, the equation of the line might be something like y equals W1 plus W2, X2. I don't know where X2 came from. X1. Um, and uh, once you have the Ws, you can make a prediction. Of course, this dotted line is not the only function that I could have chosen. I could have uh, tried to fit the data as something else so using the polynomial, using this curve here. And I could have made a much more complicated function that looks like this. And the red uh, curve that I just drew perfectly explains all the data. But this is where we are making some sort of an assumption. The assumption we are making here is the dotted line, or maybe the polynomial, whatever function class that we choose, is going to represent the true concept here. And any deviation from the true concept is actually just noise. So in this case, if we had assumed that the goal, the true, the true concept represents a dotted line, all these deviations from the dotted line are noise, and just uh, the dotted line is the true uh, nature has used the dotted line, but there's an adversary sitting between you and the nature who is just moving the points around just to confuse you, and uh, we are kind of recovering the mind of nature. How do we know that? We make an assumption. Or maybe it's a dotted, instead of the dotted line, it's a curve, and you would do the same thing. If you believe that the curve was the true answer, maybe you are willing to live with all these errors. One way or another, by making a hypothesis based assumption, you are making an assumption about the nature of the data, the nature of the process that created the data. In, uh, in addition, you're also willing to uh, live with the error that comes from the fact that the true function may lie outside your hypothesis space. This is true for regression. This is true for classification also. In regression, it's kind of very easy to uh, show the error. This is an example where the inputs are in one dimension. Uh, here's another example where the inputs are two-dimensional. Of course, I really can't plot three dimensions on a plane. So this is like a projection where the dots uh, this could be x1, here this is x, no, this is x2, this is x3, and this is y, and uh, the dots lie all over the place, and we are trying to fit a plane that uh, the, uh, that uh, best goes through these dots. Um, in two dimensions, uh, we find we, the, the so in, in two dimensions, the if with two dimensional inputs or three dimensional inputs, uh, the what we have is a plane, 
in four dimensions and above, we have a hyperplane, the same sort. Uh, except in classification, when we find a hyperplane, we don't really care about the hyperplane itself. We just say one side of the hyperplane is positive, the other side is negative. Here, we actually care about the, the, uh, the, 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 the plane itself as a function. Any questions about this? Yes. In this case, it's uh, weight one, the bias term. Yes, it is. Weight one is the bias term here. Uh, any sort of any uh, uh, expression that uh, not associated with, that's not a function of any of the inputs. So W2, X2 is a function of the input, right? W1 doesn't seem like it's associated with any of the inputs, which means from the, from the perspective of this particular instance, any instance, it's a constant. So that constant is the bias term. Yes. So it means squares will always give us a output that is just a real number and never like a range or something. The linear regression gives you an output that's just a real number and not a range. Least mean square is a technique for learning a linear regression, but linear regression just gives you a real number. If you want a range, You'll have to think about uh, confidence intervals and such things, which we are not going to cover. Today. Other questions? Yes. So, given the structure of the concept, uh, I don't understand why you say the linear number is one of the things. Given the structure, oh, I see. So, let's take that uh, one-dimensional example. Uh, the or actually, you know, yeah, let let's just take that one-dimensional example. The linear fun the this expression here is the equation of a line in two dimensions. How do I know that the true data was generated by that line? It's possible that the true data was actually generated by this curve here. Maybe the true data was generated by the curve, but we don't know because the true data, the, the true function is hidden from us. In, and the curve, maybe, I don't know, maybe it fits the data better, but we don't know what the equation of that curve is. So we have to make some sort of an assumption about the nature of the true function. If we make a simplifying assumption that the true function is a line. And by doing that, that's a linear part of linear regression. So does that other questions? Okay, so the, this is just like a high level introduction via examples and a setup of the modeling problem for linear regression. Now let's talk about the learning part. What you've seen so far is just what's the uh, instance space, basically d-dimensional vectors, what's the label space, a real number, um, and what kind of a modeling problem is it? It's a regression problem because the output's a number. We haven't talked about how to learn this particular, uh, um, oh, we also talked about what the hypothesis space is. With linear regression, the hypothesis space is just linear functions. We haven't talked about how to learn this linear function. So let's get into that now. Our goal is to find, given a data set, our goal is to find the best weight vector. So I can re sort of think of the learning problem as how do we know which weight vector is the best weight vector for this particular thing? How do we define the word best here? What might make, given an example, let's say we have an example, x, i, which is a vector whose label is yi. And let's say I have two weight vectors, w, the vector w, and the w, the vector u. What might make w better than u for this example? Yes. I don't know, okay, sure, but I, let's not, uh, let's not go into, the optimization problem. Let's talk about this one example. Just this one example. What my, uh, the, so I'm not talking about minimizing the line and uh, the distance between the line and all the examples. We just have one example. So what? Why would? Why might this vector w be better than another vector u? I think you basically kind of gave me more than what's needed. Yes. It produces an answer that's closer. It produces an answer that's closer to the true output. In fact, the perfect weight factor might be the one that gives the exact answer. So if, let's say, W transpose XI is closer to Y, to Y than 
u transpose x i, then w is better than u. What does closer mean? It's just mm -hmm. what is what does closer mean? The, the distance, uh, the difference, in fact. We're talking about real numbers. So it's just the difference. So I have, I can ask W transpose xi minus y. Is this sufficient? So, uh, or let me put it this way it's less than U transpose xi minus y. Absolute value. So you need the absolute value. Why? It's possible that you can make an error on both sides. Yeah. So you don't want that to come into play. So you want an absolute value. This quantity essentially can serve as the cost of making a mistake. So I can say a particular weight vector W gets penalized for making a mistake on this example Xi, whose label is Yi. And the penalty or the cost that it has to pay is the absolute difference between the predicted value, which is W transpose Xi, and the true value, which is just Yi. Okay, so this is just the absolute difference. So I can define the best weight vector as the one that has to pay the lowest penalty on the entire data set. Among all the weight vectors, W, U, etc., that can exist, you choose the one that has to make that has to pay the lowest penalty on not just this one example, but on all of them. Let's say we have M examples. This is the total cost of making mistakes on the entire data set. Does this any questions about this? From here, there's like a tiny little tweak that shows up. Um, turns out that playing working with absolute values is a little bit awkward because we are going to take derivatives very soon. And so let's not uh, worry about things like absolute values. Instead, another quantity that varies behaves in a similar way is the square of this absolute value, which is just the square of the difference. So that gives us the cost of any weight vector to be the total square, the total square difference of the prediction and the ground truth. I have a little, I have a half there because I'm going to take a derivative of this and I don't want to carry around a two later on. So let's don't worry about the half. This is the total cost of a weight vector. Now, importantly, this quantity is just a function of the weight vector. It's a function. And for any weight vector, I can define, I can com compute this quantity given a data. Right? And before I talk about what why this is helpful, any questions? Yes. Uh, when I take a derivative of this with respect to W, the two will come down and it will cancel out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one point. The second point is I can multiply by any positive number. It doesn't matter because all I care about is the relative order. So if, as long as it's a fixed, a fixed positive number, I can multiply by anything. Half is a convenient thing to multiply because uh, um, it makes the next step easy, or it, it actually reduces bookkeeping later on. Any questions about this? This almost should give you an idea for a learning art. There's a question on Zoom. When we talk about linearity, are we talking about uh, linear in the variables or the parameters, are we talking about OLS? We are actually talking about OLS, ordinary least squares. Uh, we are talking about linear in the variables and the parameters themselves are just what we learn. Yes. Uh, this is most of the subject mission, but uh, the path function on like the difference between uh, the predictive and the uh, known uh, level, and then the log function is just some matrix about it. No, so the log and cost are just the, uh, they're using the same. Um, in fact, lately, uh, I, I pretty much only see the word loss. And this, what I've shown here, is basically the standard loss function for regression, not even, not just linear. Anytime you have a regression problem, the loss function looks something like this. It looks like half sum over the data yi minus 
some prediction, right? So let's call that predicted. And this is going to be the loss function of for any regression problem. It doesn't matter whether we are doing linear regression, which kind of is an, is an easy case, or if this uh, prediction is coming from mm -hmm. some 700 layer neural network, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so what we have here is the sum of squared cost or losses over the training set. The recipe for learning here is, suppose I can write down this loss function, then the goal of learning is to find the rate vector that has the lowest cost on the training, on given this training data. Um, for now, let's pretend that uh, the weight vectors are not real value. Let's say that we can enumerate them. If that were the case, then you could just you could write a big for loop, actually a small for loop that takes forever to run, uh, that iterates over every vector of the form W and computes its cost and keeps track of the one that has the lowest cost. Don't ever do that. That's horrible. But conceptually, that's what it is. You are essentially, the goal of learning is to find the R min of this function. This sets up the least mean square regression problem. What we are minimizing, the goal of learning is to minimize over all the weights the mean of the squared error. At this point, somebody should have a question. Why is this the mean? Can you articulate it? Yeah. Yeah, what, what, what is the mean? What is the mean? So, so notice that this is the sum of this shaded quantity. It's the sum of that quantity over all the examples. We have M examples, right? So what if I divide the whole thing? This, let's say I divide by M. That becomes the average error over the training data. Right? So I'm dividing by M. But then do I really need to divide by M? Because M is just one by M, one divided by M is just a positive number. Mm. I don't need to multiply by multiplying by any positive number is not going to change the relative ordering of the weights. So having a one divided by M there is going to force me to keep that quantity along for the entire rest of the algorithm, which is why. I say mean square error, but it's basically the sum because sum and mean are uh, just a constant of yes. Which one is the straight up error? Okay. Yi minus W transpose Xi. So let's consider the case. Let's consider the following case. Uh, I'm going to, instead of calling it W transpose X, actually, you know what? Let's write it this way. So let's uh, build a table of this. So I have Yi. And W transpose XI. Was there a question on Zoom? No. And this quantity here. And instead of doing this, I could have just rewritten it, but yeah. So let's say YI is 5 and W transpose XI is 2. What's the error? Hmm? Three. three. Just the error. Uh, well, I'm going to do that, that quantity there is three. So you'd say that the penalty on this weight vector W for this example is three. So this example is not great. This weight vector is not great. But let's say the prediction is five and the ground truth is five and the prediction is eight. Here, the difference is minus three. These two, as far as I'm concerned, are the same mistake on either side of the real number of the thing. I don't really care about if I, if instead of minimizing the squared error, I just minimize the error. What would happen is the best weight vector, any optimizer, what any reasonable optimizer, what it would do is it would say, I'm, I'm trying to minimize this quantity. So I need to make this difference as low as possible. So this quantity here is more than this. So this is good. But I could make it even worse. Instead of eight, let me find a weight vector that predicts 10. So that makes this difference five, minus five. But hey, why, ten, why stop at 10? Why not 10 power six? So then you get almost 
a minus a million. Mm -hmm. Why not 10, why 10 power 6? Why not find a weight vector that makes the prediction minus infinity or no, plus infinity? Then the difference becomes minus infinity, which is the lowest you can get. So you will not really learn a weight vector if you do not have squared errors. What your optimizer, if it's correct, what it will do is it will set all the weights to infinity. Yes. So then why can't you take the absolute That's the other interesting question. I could have, instead of taking the square, I could have taken the absolute value. And the reason typically we don't work with the absolute value is because um, when we when we're going to take the uh, gradient of this function and absolute value has a point where it's not differentiable, it's not worth going there. Are bigger differences in the value that we use a larger error too? Yes. Yes. Is there a question? Yes. Yeah, so, like, like, is this the square is also like punishing me for bigger differences? That's true. So, the square also says bigger differences have bigger penalties. So, if the gap between the prediction and the ground truth is larger, then you penalize the the model more. As a result, because you know, think about how the square function is. This is a square, whereas the line goes like this. So here, as the as the difference gets bigger and bigger, the square function penalizes the thing more, and that could be a good thing or a bad thing. There is a situation in which it can lead to bad outcomes because uh, it is this this whole approach becomes more sensitive to outliers. Uh, but we'll we'll not go there yet. Okay, so what we have here is the beginning of a generally good idea, which is if I have an if I have a learning problem, I can if I can write down the penalty that my model has to pay for a mistake on one example. I'll call that the loss. This is loss on one example. Then by adding up the losses on the entire data set, I have set up an optimization problem. And if I can solve an optimization problem, I have essentially invented a learning algorithm. This is true for regression. It's true, turns out, as we will see, also for classification. And this is the uh, this is a very productive idea. It turns out this forms the basis of a lot of modern machine learning, where we really don't want to invent a new learning algorithm every time we have to do something instead. We use the fact that we can recast learning the problem of learning into optimization problems and define the objective that we want to optimize. So the, the game then becomes not how do I define an algorithm, but how do I define an objective for optimization? The right objective for regression is exactly this: the squared error. For classification, as we will see, there are other there are standard objective functions that we let on. The good news here is then this can lead to uh, an entire cottage industry of people working on how to build good optimizers. And the even better news is this cottage industry has existed for many, many decades right now because that's an entire mathematical optimization is an entire uh, field of mathematics of its own. So we can essentially make the problem of learning their problem. You can just tell them, uh, I've written down an objective I know it's your problem. Figure out the weight factor. Well, it's going to be our problem, your problem, because uh, we're going to be going through this in a bit of detail. There are many different strategies for learning by optimization. Perhaps the most dominant approaches for learning by optimization involve uh, one way or another the gradient descent algorithm. For this specific optimization problem, it turns out you can use techniques from Calc 3. Uh, just take the derivative of this and set this to zero, and you will get you'll be able to solve the thing on paper without actually using an algorithm. But um, if we do that, then uh, the rest of this lecture is just going to be you and I staring at each other. So let's go through the optimization problem because it turns out in doing that we will actually uncover um, the uh, we will uncover uh, the a general recipe for how a lot of machine learning is built today. Any questions about, yes. Uh, 
Uh, I don't understand the English. So basically, you are adding up all the squares. Not least squares. You are adding up all the squares. Yeah. Wouldn't it be one value? It'll be a number. It's just a number. What's the word? Oh, the min. Here? Yeah. Yeah. So this quantity here is exactly this quantity here, right? It's a function of the weight. And when I say min, I say among for all you among all the weight vectors that exist. So this is J of W is let me draw the box around the right thing. That thing is J of W. It's a function of the weight. And minimum the min says find the weight vector that minimizes that quantity. Right? All right, so let's see how we can solve this with gradient descent. How many people have seen gradient descent before? A smaller number, but uh, good. Uh, then we'll, uh, this should be fine. Gradient descent is a general strategy for minimizing any function. Let's say a function like this, J or W. Today we care about this specific function, J or W, where in the cartoon example here, this is a function that the horizontal axis represents the W, the vertical axis represents the value of J. In practice, the horizontal axis is not just one dimension, but it's like, oh, imagine that inside that line, I'm packing all the dimensions that are in the input. But of course, I can't draw the dimensions on a plane, so let's pretend it's one. Any point here corresponds to some W, and the value here, the height here, is the value of your W. Okay? So our goal is to minimize this function. Now, if it was as simple as just eyeballing this, we basically say that the minimum is there. So we want to find an algorithm that, given the definition of this function of this sort, notice by the way, that function is defined in terms of the data. So the in, internally, there's the xi, yi, and all that. So that function is a data driven function. Different data sets will give you different values of different definitions of the algorithm. Our goal is to minimize this. Thing. Gradient descent is a general strategy for minimizing these kinds of functions. All we need this function to do for us is it needs to be differential. We need to be able to calculate the gradient. So it, it, it behaves like this. You start off with some initial guess. Let's say this point here, W0. Some initial guess for the, the, the function. So at this W, the value of the function is whatever that thing is there. Now, I think the best sort of visual or the, the, the best metaphor for gradient descent involves hiking. Uh, imagine that you are lost in the mountains, <laughs> and for some reason you need to find the valley, the bottom of the 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 the, the current, the, the, the absolute bottom of the valley. <laughs> and imagine that instead of actually looking around and going there, let's say that you are in a fog. You can't really see too far. All you can do, standing where you are, is you maybe look around and you can say, this is the direction in which the mountain is going, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is or the function is increasing the height. This is the direction in which the slope goes up. What does that mean? That simply, in, in more formally, is the gradient. The gradient of the function gives you a direction in which the function increases the path at any point. And uh, uh, what you would do at that, what you could do when you're trying to find the bottom of the valley is you kind of feel around, you find this is the direction in which the slope is going up, you go points opposite direction and you take a step in the opposite direction. So in this case, at W naught, it says the function is going up, this is the gra gradient, this is the direction. If you, if you take a step in that direction, you'll be going up, you take a step in the opposite direction and you come to a new point from to, from to W1. And at this point, you are at a new point. You do the same thing again. You compute the gradient of the function at the current point. The gradient gives you the direction in which the function increases the fastest. You turn around, you take a step in the opposite direction. You keep repeating this again and again till eventually you come to a point and uh, where the gradient doesn't increase much. Meaning this line basically becomes flat. At which point you come to the minimum. 
This is like the general sort of a intuition for any gradient descent algorithm. You take, you compute the gradient of the function, the gradient corresponds to the direction in which the function increases the fastest. You So you take a step in the exact opposite direction. And the really cool thing, which, you know, it, it turns out it requires a theorem here, but we won't be doing it. The really cool thing is this simple procedure is guaranteed to get you to the minimum of the function, provided the function is convex. Convex means essentially there's only one minimum and the function is, is, is like a bowl, it's like this thing here. So there's only one value. If there's one global minimum and the function is differentiable, all you need to do is you don't need any sort of global behavior of the function. All you, uh, you, all you need to do is at any point, find the gradient, take a step in the opposite direction and keep iterating this till infinity or till you get to the point where the gradient no longer changes. Any questions? I mean, I've given you like, this is just like a cartoon version of gradient descent. We'll be going over this a few times, yes. That's right, right here. All we are doing here is we've set up an optimization problem. As long as you and I agree that that optimization problem captures whatever we want about the problem. The, the task of solving that optimization problem, why do you care how it's done as long as it comes with the guarantee that you've solved it. Then once you get the optimum rate, you can interpret it however you want. So this is like a cool sort of a separation of uh, responsibilities. There is the statement of the problem. What is the objective learning? I need to minimize the, the total, the average loss over the data. How you solve the optimization problem is an op is somebody else's problem. Um, it's a different algorithm. Questions? Other questions? So anyway, we keep doing this till we run out of time or run out of patience, or till the gradient does not change so much that we have any uh, we have to worry about. It. Let's. Uh, if there are no questions, we can kind of take this idea and try to make shape this into something that looks like an algorithm. Um, let's, uh, and I'm going to ground this in the context of these three squares, but uh, later on I'll be talking about this for other uh, learning, uh, other sort of learning situations. For these three squares, we need to initialize the weight vector W0, and we need to iterate multiple times. We have some function J of W. We compute the gradient of J of W wt at the point w, uh, wt, let's call this nabla j, is the gradient of j. And we've computed the gradient, we need to take a step in the opposite direction. So wt plus one is wt minus the gradient, and r here is the step size. So the metaphor for step size is how big of a step are you taking in the opposite direction. If r is really small, you're taking a tiny step and recomputing the gradient. If r is really large, you uh, take a large step. Sometimes it's also called the learning rate. For now, let's pretend that it's a small constant. We'll get to the details of this learning rate later. This is like the the um, the skeleton of uh, the gradient descent algorithm. Can you implement this? How do you implement this? What what's stopping you from implementing? Calculating the, Calculating the gradient. Did someone else, uh, someone else answered the same thing? How do you calculate the gradient? How do you calculate the gradient? Hmm. Take the derivative. Okay, so let the nice thing about this particular objective is you can actually do the whole thing on paper. So let's let's go through this uh, process of calculating the gradient. Let's compute the gradient of this. Um, uh, let's derive an expression that uh, calculates the gradient of this part. Just a reminder, if you have a function, j, j is a function that takes a weight vector. Remember, the weight vector is a d-dimensional vector, right? So it maps rd to r. The output's a real number. It takes any d-dimensional um, point, the weight, weight, and it produces a real number, the cost or the loss. 
a general sort of a, a statement about gradient is the gradient of any function looks like the input. So the gradient of j at any point wt is a vector that has the d element. In. So the, another way of thinking about it is the gradient of a function, so rv to r, has d elements, each of them corresponding to the derivative of that function with respect to the ith um, wave element. So uh, this is should not be a shock. I hope you have encountered this in some version of calculus that you see. I hope you have, right? I mean, it's not, uh, I, otherwise we can spend a bit of time on that. There are only two answers, yes or no, and somehow you are taking a third option here. Yes, I see one thumbs up, so we've seen this. Um, so the gradient is a vector, we need to find uh, d gradient, and the weight vector is also a vector with d elements. So all we need to do is to compute the derivative of this function with respect to any one of these j's, and it's going to show up, it's going to be the same thing all the way, uh, all the way through. And once, and just once, I'm going to go through this process of computing the partial derivative of j with respect to w sub j in gory detail. Later on, I'll just leave it as an exercise for you, or maybe I'll just kind of hand wave it. But for now, I just want to go through this in some detail. Go, going ahead, you should be able to follow a similar sort of a procedure for other types of gradients. So our goal is to take the derivative of j with respect to wj. But the function j is nothing but this expression here. So I can trivially substitute that. No questions uh, asked there. The derivative of a sum is nothing but the sum of derivatives. So I can move the uh, this partial derivative operator inside. And I'm left with the derivative of a square. The derivative of a square is simply twice whatever is here times the de derivative of this thing here, the quantity, what I've written here is nothing but yi minus w transpose xi. I've just uh, extended, uh, you know, opened up the definition of the transpose. w transpose xi is nothing but w1 x1 plus w2 x2 and so on. Okay? Either this is too much detail or this is too fast. Um, in either case, I'm going to charge ahead. Now, in, in this big expression here, none of those terms have a wj except for this j term. So all the other derivatives become zero, and this one gives you a minus xij, the ith feature for the j, sorry, the j feature for the ith example. We are sitting, summing over examples here. And all that's left here is now to clean up. The first cleanup is getting rid of this two, and this answers the question, why do I have a two? Because eventually I'm going to take a derivative. And uh, let's move the minus outside, and I have the full gradient. So the partial derivative of j with respect to wj is just some negative sum over all the examples, this error times the theta value. This is just one element of this vector, the vector of gradients. I do this once for each feature and I get the full vector. Any questions? Yes. What is the J here? So remember, W is a vector with D elements. I'm indexing one of the entries of that vector as wj. So w is a vector that looks like this, w1. This is the j element of that vector. Oh. We do that once for each element of the weight vector. That, that's how we get one element, each element of the gradient vector, yes. The purpose of computing the gradient of the cost is if you can do this, then we can plug this into the gradient descent algorithm here. 
you compute the gradient and this is a this basically the actual direction the negative of the gradient is the direction that we will use to update the bridge so the gradient is the direction in which the function increases the path okay. It's updating the weight. So we start off with one, one weight vector. At each point, we compute the gradient. The gradient is a vector. And the gradient says, um, let's consider this two dimensional, three dimensional space. Let's say that the input space is two dimensions and the function value increases with this. Let's say currently they're standing where I am. And there is a, uh, there's some value of the function here. If let's say the gradient points in this direction, that means going in this direction is how the function increases the path. That's the sort of the intuition, intuitive uh, definition of a gradient. So a reasonable thing to do is to take a step, not in the direction in which the function goes up the fastest, but the exact opposite direction, which is why we have a minus here. And so if you can compute the gradient, that gives you the direction in which the function goes the, grows the fastest, and you keep taking steps in the opposite direction. So what we have here is a vector of gradients, and uh, basically we are done. We can compute the gradient of the function at the current point, which requires us, um, you know, for every train. This is a summation over the entire training data for every training example. You evaluate the function, and you compute this difference here. You multiply the feature. You know, basically you, you perform these operations. There is a little bit of an intuition for this. You know, sometimes people like to note, it, note that the gradient for least mean square regression has this nice property. The gradient of this for the gate feature is that for every example, you compute the error, not the absolute error, not the square error, just the raw error. Mm -hmm. Multiply it with the feature value, you add them up, and uh, you get the, the gradient. Anyway, so you compute the gradient, and this, uh, this, this there will be d such terms because uh, there we are in d dimension, and this is just one of those elements of the gradient. Yes. Yeah. You know, I'm looking for the spot where the gradient is just really, really, really small. That's right. So we won't get an actual zero. You may not get an actual zero. You will get to something that is very low, and. Uh, Eventually, what you will do is uh, that's why I put dot 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 here. How many times do you do this? You do this till you have converged. What does converge? How, how many times do you do what? Basically, that update. You keep taking this update till you converge. What does convergence mean? You can compute. You can define convergence in different ways. One way of doing that is if the gradient, the absolute, the magnitude of the gradient is really small. Gradient is a vector, right? So you, you're sort of calculating the gradient. If it's a very small vector, then you're not going to take a big step. Might as well just call it quit. Another way of computing, uh, deciding where to stop is you have only so much time left. Um, you can only take, you have only this much of a compute budget. Another way of deciding where to stop is you compute the function value before and after the step. And if that is below from threshold, you decide your time. So the, essentially, one way or another, the, some convergence criteria that needs to be defined. So uh, there's a question. All these values get put into a vector, and the vector is used for finding a new point that's closer to the minimum of the loss function. That's right. This vector, all of these uh, values together, they form the gradient vector. And this gradient vector takes uh, takes us, because of the properties of gradient descent, it, it is guaranteed to take us to a new point, wt plus one, that is better. And by better, I mean it is it has a lower value of the loss, which means it's closer to the minimum. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other questions. We are calculating just the slope and multiplying by the fixed factor. Basically, yes. Uh, for now, it's fixed. I'm assuming that by fixed factor, you mean the r. For now, the learning rate is fixed, but actually the learning rate will change as we go along. And the size of the steps, that's the, it's related to this. The size of the steps is, isn't is constant. It's related to the sleep steepness of the slope. Yeah, in fact, uh, the actual length of the step you take might depend on the, the magnitude of that function, provided the learning rate is fixed. 
In fact, the size of the step tends to be a variable just because that R itself tends to be variable. It depends on uh, where you are in the optimization. You are actually implementing this even in your homework for perceptron. You have a step size R where I say there's a decaying learning rate. That's just saying the step size gets smaller and smaller the longer you run the, after the, the algorithm. Why? Because you don't want to take giant steps when you're very close to the minimum. But because you're close to the minimum, taking a giant, giant step will take you further away. So you want to take a, a smaller steps as optimization proceeds. This, by the way, is a big hint that it turns out the perceptron algorithm that you're implementing is also optimizing some, is also performing gradient descent on something. We'll see that much, much later. Did we cover all the questions on Zoom? I think so. Okay. So we have this. this we have this algorithm here. And uh, you know, you keep running this till the total error goes below some threshold, till some convergence criterion is satisfied. Um, R here is once again the learning rate, mm -hmm. the step size. And uh, we'll it, it, for now it's a constant, but in practice, as I said, it can be K. This algorithm is remarkable because it's guaranteed to converge to the minimum of the true function, meaning it's guaranteed to find the weight vector that minimizes that function, provided this function is convex. Um, it turns out that this objective is a convex function. Now, we are not going to get into the details of convexity and convex functions now, partly because that's going to take us on a detour that I don't want to go to. But turns out if you have a convex function, gradient descent is guaranteed to work. A convex function for now is just a function that looks like a cup. It has just one minimum and uh, it satisfies a few other properties. In fact, it satisfies just one property, which is the definition of the convex function, but it looks like a cup. Okay, so we've gone through gradient descent. Any questions about it? Yes. So we know that the uh, uh, if we take the and if it's equal to zero. So why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? So you just uh, for so let's let uh, uh, kind of I, I want to just write down what you just said. So we have a function j of w, which is half. We have this function here and we want to find its minimum and your suggestion is this algorithm seems really complicated can i just compute the solve for this equation can i just solve for this equation yes. i know how to calculate the, the gradient so i can just solve for this equation and i'm guaranteed by the way this is a vector here vector of zeros because this is a vector of gradient so I, I, I'm trying to, if I just solve for this equation, I should be able to find the solution. Mm -hmm. Turns out you're absolutely right. For this particular objective, there exists a closed form solution for this equation. And I'll leave that as an exercise for you to solve it. But for other types of modeling problems, we can't do that. The, uh, for instance, even uh, for, for classification type problems, where we will write down a cost function, there are there is no analytical solution. We can't, there is no way to set that derivative to zero and solve for it on paper. So we have no choice but to use an algorithmic solution. In this particular case, for this particular objective, the least mean square objective for linear regression, it turns out has a special property in that it can be solved on paper. Uh, someone else had a question. I, I know I saw a hand go up, but then did you? That is absolutely right. For every step here, we are summing over all the examples. Was there a question? Or... Okay. Yeah. So for every, yes. Uh, so meter test, that wave, uh, wave function is a detective. Is a what? Meter Yes. So uh, the uh, Landscape of X. Mm -hmm. so, of X. We, uh, actually, the X is uh, they actually determine the shape of the wave. 
the x and the y together because there's also a y there, right? Yeah. So uh, no matter what the x and y's are, it is also it is always guaranteed that the shape of the data will be complete. Yes. Yes. In fact, that's that's a good question. Uh, um, we'll get to that discussion when we talk about convexity yeah. later on. But you are absolutely right. No matter what the data is, this function is guaranteed to be convex. I'll give you a small hint. This function is basically the sum of a bunch of squares. Turns out the square function is convex. And the sum of convex functions is convex. That's all we need to. Other questions? I want to go back to this. Um, what we just saw is gradient descent. And now I want to introduce uh, something called stochastic gradient descent. Or sometimes it used to be called incremental gradient descent. I don't think it's called that anymore. Um, but um, to kind of motivate this, I want to zero in on this point that you just raised. To calculate the gradient of, to take one update, to just make one update on the weight, I need to iterate over the entire data set for each feature and compute you know, the sum. Imagine that instead of the, 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 the example that I had, had uh, four data points. There were four rows in that table. Instead of four rows, let's say we have 40 million rows. So just take one update for the weight. I need to iterate over 40 million entries and compute the thing. What if, why do I need to do that? Maybe after iterating through 10 of them, I know that the cost is going to be large. I know that the weights that I'm currently sitting on are really bad. Let me just move out of here. I, I could be able to you know, make that estimate without iterating through all 40 million by just looking at a small number of examples, right? Just a small number of them. I can, uh, if I, I, I can imagine I'm able to pull out 10 examples and pretend that these, this is all the data I have out of those 40 million and uh, compute the gradient this way. And that gives me a reasonable step. Why do I need to iterate through all the data? This is a, the, iterating through all the data to compute one step is a problem because we are not doing that one time. We are doing that until the total error is below some threshold, which means that we're going to keep doing that. This is in the innermost loop. So we're going to, uh, you know, we, we're going to do this again and again. The weight vector is not updated till all the errors are calculated. And the question that we're thinking about is, can we make early updates to the weight vector as soon as we encounter errors, rather than having to wait through the entire data? You're saying you have 40 million examples, and you just want to wait for the examples? Maybe. Maybe. First time or some random time. But. Yeah. Do the sense comes from the set of Yes, that's right. Not from the set of not from the set of features, from the set of examples. And, you know, I said 10, I just picked 10 randomly. It could be 10, it could be 500. For now, I'm going to pretend, let's say it's just one. We pick one random example, compute its error, and take a gradient. What makes 10 special? So, doing that gives you something called stochastic gradient effect. Which threshold? The convergent? It's the same story. Um, you will get that yeah. So, stochastic gradient descent. Oh, there's a um, there's a question. By multiplying by x i j, do we project each point to the dimension j? It, you don't project each point to the well. Technically, yes. Uh, you are essentially taking only the jth dimension for each point uh, to compute the gradient for the jth uh, element of the weight vector. So uh, let's come back to stochastic gradient descent. It's a rather simple recipe. You, you repeat the following process again and again. You pick a random example from the data. You pretend that this example is a representative of the entire data set. If it's a representative of the entire data set, or you can pretend that this example is the entire data set you have, which means you can write down the loss function for that one example. If you have a data set with one example, the loss consists of a it, there's no summation, right? It's just one term. You use that loss to take a gradient step. 
you update the model. Now, your, your weights are in a new place. You pick another random example. This example is now the representative of the entire data. You pretend that this is all the data you have. You compute the gradient. You take another step. You keep doing this basically forever. And the amazing thing is this randomized sort of strategy or stochastic strategy is also guaranteed to converge to the minimum of your convex function. But the guarantee is a little weaker. It's guaranteed to con converge in expectation. In other words, if you run this process to infinity, you'll get to the minimum, uh, provided a few conditions are true about the, the learning rate. But for now, I want to contrast this against the batch version of gradient descent that we saw before. In the batch version of gradient descent, to compute one update to the weights, you need to sum over the entire data. You need to calculate the gradient over all the examples and then add up all the gradients and take a step. Here, in this case, in the simplest version of stochastic gradient descent, to compute one update, you just take one, you take one example and you are immediately able to make an early, some sort of an early update to your weights. You see an example, you notice that it makes an error, you immediately make an update. Questions? Let me just uh, write this down as an algorithm. You initialize your weight once again, and you iterate again and again. So for here, uh, you, you iterate over, you iterate multiple times, and then there's another loop for every training example. You pick an example, and you pretend that that example is the entire data you have, which means for xi, yi, I can write down the loss, which is yi minus w transpose xi squared. This is the loss for that example. And so I can calculate the gradient of this loss, which is simply yi minus w transpose i minus. This is the gradient for the i element. This is the same thing that we had before. Earlier, we had a summation here. Now we don't. So I can now update the weight. This is the update. I'm just to kind of write it differently. This is the the jth element of the feature vector of the weight vector. So this you're doing this for every element of the weight vector. So you update the weight according to this one example, and you're done. In the previous method, where the weights are updated after all examples are processed, here every time you see an example, you make an update and you iterate over the data set again and again. This particular update rule, it turns out, is actually really old. It was, uh, it was, I think, from the 50s or maybe even before that. It's called the Widow Hoff rule for learning neural networks, maybe the 50s or 60s. Um, it, it's basically just a simple update rule that says my weight, the new weight, is the old weight plus error times the feature. And there's a step size, there's a learning rate that uh, dictate how much, this, how, how big should this update. Any questions about this? This is our first introduction to stochastic gradient descent. Turns out uh, we will be looking at stochastic gradient descent many, many times in the semester. I'll just present it in a slightly different notation. It turns out we've already seen a version of stochastic gradient descent before. Except I didn't present it that way. Uh, the perceptron algorithm where you're iterating over the data multiple times, the one that you're implementing for your homework, is actually a stochastic gradient descent. It's an instance of, of that for a different loss function. This is a this is stochastic gradient descent for the least mean square regression. In practice, um, on, these sorts of stochastic algorithms are preferred uh, over standard batch gradient descent simply because they tend to converge much faster, especially when the data set is really, really large. Um, because you don't need to iterate over the entire data set. You probably could, don't even need to see the entire data set to get a good estimate of the gradient. So you might as well just make quick updates. Um, amazingly, there are results that show that uh, this process might actually get closer to the optimum than the batch gradient descent. Uh, because of this property, you know, because of the fact that you don't need to see the data, all the data to get a good estimate of the data. Yes, questions. 
Ah, good question. So the question is um, um, also uh, essentially the same question on uh, Zoom also. Why am I calling this stochastic? There's nothing, there's no randomness here. I'm iterating over the, the, this step here is just saying I need to iterate many, many times. There's no randomness. This one says for each training example, there's no randomness. Why is this called stochastic gradient descent? In practice, and also for the theory to work, you don't iterate over the data in the same order. You, you, the, the version of this algorithm that has a theorem attached to it um, says you pick a random example with replacement from the training pool. And each in, in, for each training example, it is for a randomly sampled example from the training set. Um, and the randomly sampled example is uh, from uh, with replacement. In practice, however, you don't do that. Instead, in practice, what the version that's usually implemented is you take your data set, shuffle it. So you have a shuffle here. You shuffle the data and then you iterate over it. So every iteration, you're is going over the same data, but in a different order. And that's where the randomness also comes in. Um, incidentally, this algorithm, stochastic gradient descent, not for least mean square regression, is also an algorithm from the 50s. It used to be called the Robbins Munro update. Um, um, just a little bit of trivia there. But there was another question. So, T is, the epoch. T is exactly the epochs. So, uh, you are iterating over the data for multiple epochs. In each epoch, you first shuffle the data and then you, and you go over the data uh, one example at a time. You are now sitting on one example. You pretend that that example is all your data that exists. You write down the loss function, compute the gradient, take an update. Then go to the next example, pretend that that is now the all the data that exists, take an update. Yes. So, all of you have been, if you reach the end of the first two part, mm -hmm. and then you have gone below or down to the gradient, you're done. You can stop. So, you don't have to do you don't need, need to do all these parts. Um, usually, the way this is done, though, is you compute the value of J of W. You track the value of J of W. And uh, you start off with J of W being a certain value, and then you go through this whole the data, compute the value of the loss once again, and you measure the difference. If that difference is below some threshold, then you consider, you, you declare a victory. Other question? Why is the sign positive here? There's a question about where is the sign? Uh, I, I'm assuming that uh, uh, you're talking about this sign here, right? I'll tell you why that's positive and you can tell, okay, that is the one you're talking about. So this is the, the, the good question. So remember that the gradient that we derived was minus yi minus w transpose xi times xij. And here I have a plus. Why did the minus become a plus? Because wt plus one at the jth term is wt of the jth term minus r times the gradient. So it is, you're taking a step in the opposite direction of the gradient. It just so happens that these two minuses cancel each other out and you're left with this. Other questions? So let me finally get to this uh, thing that I kept avoiding about learning rates. Um, uh, it turns out that the choice of R plays a big role in decide uh, in, in the convergence. In the general case, and I say non-separable here partly because the same idea also applies for classification. Uh, in the general case for stochastic gradient descent to work, your learning rate cannot be a constant. Your learning rate has to keep decreasing till it eventually goes to infinity, uh, goes to zero when the number of steps is infinity. So you need some sort of a learning rate decay schedule. There are many, many learning rate decay schedules out there. Um, 
but you need some sort of a, a, a decreasing step size for convergence to work. Learning, learning, and there's a huge uh, uh, sort of, uh, there has been a lot of effort on deciding the best learning rate. The step size can be chosen automatically. There are algorithms that choose the step size automatically based on some assumptions about the data and such thing. And that leads to faster convergence. Also, you know, if you choose a better starting point, of course, you're gonna leave, you're gonna take fewer steps. But that's something that you may not be able to control because you don't know where the starting point is. So in practice, the starting point could be just some random vector or zero or something like that. Um, gradient descent is very simple. Stochastic gradient descent is even simpler. And by that, I mean implementing it is even simpler. And yet it is, in some sense, like has become the backbone of modern machine learning. A majority of the algorithms that we encounter in this in this semester, it turns out can be viewed from the lens of gradient descent of stochastic gradient descent. Um, the state of the art for building the biggest models out there today depends at some in some form or another on some version of uh, uh, think of it as a grown up version of stochastic gradient descent with fancy step size selection and uh, Few other you know bells and whistles, but the kernel of the idea is exactly that. I would like to minimize the loss over a data set. I cannot compute the loss over the data set for to take one step because the data set is too big. Instead, I subsample some number of examples from the data set. In the extreme case, just one of them, and I pretend that that subsample is my entire data set. I compute the loss. I compute the gradient on that sample, then take a step. This is going to be like the backbone of a lot of uh, algorithms that we encounter. Questions? Yes. That's a very good question. So let me repeat the question. There is a randomness that's inherent in stochastic gradient descent, which means that two different runs of the same code might produce two different answers because you're shuffling the code, you're shuffling the examples or you're picking examples randomly. That's absolutely right. However, despite that, for convex functions, stochastic gradient descent will eventually reach the optimum, which means for convex functions, if you let stochastic gradient descent run long enough, your two different runs will get to almost the same point. They might be slightly different. But in practice, you're going to you're not going to run it to optimum. You're going to run it to some place before that because you don't have enough infinite time. So because of that, your SGD might two runs might actually take us to different places. This is the reason why anytime we do machine learning experiments, because most of machine learning today depends on stochastic gradient descent. Anytime we do machine learning experiments for reproducible experiments, including in your homework, actually, a good practice is to set the random seed so that someone else who runs the code will go through the same sequence of steps. So always get into the habit of setting the random seed at the beginning of your experiment. Even for this submission, you can do that. There's just a minute left, so I want to wrap up this discussion of linear regression. The goal is to predict the real value output using some feature representation of the input. And the hypothesis assumption that we are making with linear regression is that the output is a linear function of the inputs. And what we saw today was the first instance of uh, uh, using an as framing learning as an optimization problem. So we define a loss function or a cost function, and we minimize that cost function using an algorithm. We saw two algorithms for that, gradient descent, which mostly you'll never be implementing because its cousin, stochastic gradient descent, is much better. In both cases, though, the goal is to find the best weight vector where we define best according to some cost. Um, it turns out that this particular optimization problem for linear regression can be solved analytically, as I mentioned. I encourage you to think about how to do that. I'll leave it as an exercise. Um, you can write down the gradient descent problem for that mileage example that I showed and see if you can 
find the best way for that, or maybe write a small program for that. Then if you feel like you want to do some math, you can show that I'll not read it out, but you can actually solve the, here's the solution for the analytical version of mean square regression. All right, I'll stop now. Um, don't forget office hours. Uh, I'll be in my office if you have any questions.